Well, welcome to the 5D Academy of Higher Consciousness. I'm Zarathustra, broadcasting live from Los Angeles. And um, one of our participants asked me to talk about fear. Is that right, Ms. Hilde? That's yeah, right. Wanna... Thank you. Yeah. And fear, fear in general, right? Yeah. Cool. All right. So we're going to talk about that. For the moment, let's do a simple meditation as we always do. Just basically relax, dive within yourself, turn your attention inwards, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and just relax in this moment. And Turn your attention towards the source of yourself, the very source of the self. It's just a shift of the attention from the outside, from the mind, emotions, the problems we deal with, the world. And then we're shifting our attention inwards. And as you're just relaxing within yourself, <clears throat> it's kind of like um, you have a clear glass, there's water in it and you pour sugar into it, or it's tea, and you stir the sugar. And it's going to take a little bit of time for whatever sugar that doesn't dissolve in the water to settle down. Things to settle down. things to come down. The mind in the beginning may be busy, but then it slowly mellows down and becomes quiet.
So just hang out in the space in meditation.
slowly, slowly come back. Come back here. Okay. So um, those of you who are, are with us today through Facebook, um, I apologize that you have to see my, my mic, but um, so it will show up on the screen. I can't really move it because if I move it, then I won't be able to do the podcast. So for now, we're just going to have to roll with it, with whatever we got. But thank you for informing me. I can see it on, on the screen of my phone. So, okay. So we're going to talk about fear. Fear is basically... Uh, it's a, actually, this is a very good subject. Thank you, my dear sister Hilde for bringing it up. Can everybody hear me? Am, am I, am I clear? Okay, good. And, um, it's some things that basically built in, in our nervous system. And it's a part of our makeup fear and then we're not the only one uh, only species who experiences fear other species they they experience fear too uh but there is levels of fear and fear is a natural thing and it's not really a bad thing uh and uh it's a part of our makeup that we experience fear and and at a lot of times that experiencing fear is a, a necessity because it's going to help to preserve the mechanism the unit the person uh, or the species whatever it is it's a dog it's a cat it's a deer it's a whatever it is, and from uh, being eaten or being killed or being damaged or attacked, or uh, it's for the preservation of the species. Well, right now we're basically interested in human beings and ourselves. So this is, so I'll just stick to that one. Uh, So if somebody runs up to me right now with a knife in their hand, and and appears that they're going to stab me naturally um, my heartbeat will go up and I start uh, experiencing adrenaline in my body and reacting to it and fear appears Um, the fear of getting stopped fear of trying to preserve yourself or defend yourself or uh, you're walking in a dark alley at night uh, and uh, there's someone behind you or somebody appears in front of you, uh, you get afraid. Or if you're lost somewhere in the middle of the night, you're driving and you're lost or many, many different scenarios. You're in a metro or whatever. Whatever is the case, uh, fear appears. Now, that's one kind of fear that you experience in regards to preserving your body, preserving yourself from being murdered or damaged or raped or killed or whatever, whatever is the scenario. And there is also, but that's a different story that, uh, 
in regards, I think when Hilda mentioned fear, uh, I, I believe it's more than living in fear. So a lot of people on this planet, I would say a very big uh, portion of the population of the planet, they live in fear. Living in fear is a different story than being afraid, getting afraid because you're threatened or something has happened or someone's threatening your family or, or you. But a lot of people are living in fear and that's a different scenario. So fear is really not a bad thing, but if you're living in fear, then that's, that's different. Now, you could be living in a uh, surrounding or living in a country with the government that it's um, creating fear all the time. You you have no security. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, they may just barge into your home in the middle of the night and execute you or imprison or prison you. Um, you know, it happens. It ha all over the world. Uh, it could be a scenario that you're afraid you lose your retirement money um, or you're afraid of the future. What's going to happen to me financially? What's going to happen to planet Earth? What's going to happen to the environment for my how are my kids going to be living? Uh, what's going to happen 10 years from now on to the planet? Is it going to be the temperature of it is going to go up? Are we going to lose our resources, uh, we're going to run out of good water or we're going, uh, the ozone is going to have a big hole in it. Um, there's so many different scenarios. And it's the nature of the mind to project into the future and, and projecting fear projecting into things that it cannot understand, uh, cannot go there. And what the mind does is using a past experience or whatever it knows from the past and project it into the future. It creates stuff like what's going to happen to me. What's going to, it's always when the mind comes and now we're talking about, I'm not talking about that if at one moment something happened and your life is threatened or your car goes down the hill or, and it's rolling down the hill or you're almost caught in in the currents in the ocean and you're about to be drowned i'm not talking about that kind of fear well we can talk about that later but what i think and feel like a lot of people are dealing with is that the fear of future basically the fear of the future because the fear in the present moment is instant. So something can happen and triggers your nervous system and you're, you experience fear in the moment. And then half an hour after, an hour after the fear is gone, the nervous system calms down and well, you know, Maybe you go have a glass of wine. Maybe you go smoke a cigarette. Maybe you go for a walk, for a run or drive or whatever it is, or eat some ice cream and you calm down and your nervous system calms down. But the fear we're talking about is basically the fear of the unknown. Fear of not knowing what's going to happen in the future. And this idea of what is going to happen in the future is basically it's related to me to the i to the i thought 
And the I thought I is the person who has this sense of separation. So basically, when we're talking about fear, it's basically we're talking about me. You're talking about you, your existence of what's going to happen to me. That's where it stems from. That's where it's foundation. That's where it's coming from. And then you may say, well, I'm really worried and concerned about my children. And I'm concerned about what's going to happen to planet Earth. Yes. And that's a concern a lot of people have in regards to uh, their children, family, country, environment, animals, vegetation, uh, the future of human race. And that's very noble, but that's not what we are really, uh, when you go deeper within ourselves and you really take a look at it, it always going to be me. It always comes from the root chakra. It always goes back to you. To you because you're the one who's afraid. You're the one who's experiencing the fear. And you can take a look at it. You can you should examine this for yourself. Because it's this subject is very big. And it it also goes back to a lot of different things from the time you were born, your genetics, you know, your DNA makeup, what kind of family you grew up in. Is this a type of an environment that your family, your parents, uh, your guardians, whomever you grew up with, they're, they're the type of people who are always afraid and they're always projecting uh, to th into things. Um, I personally grew up with parents who were always afraid of a lot of different things. Like if I wanted to go out on the street and play football, they were afraid. If I wanted to go swimming, they were afraid. If I wanted to go uh, to school, they were afraid. If I wanted to go skiing, they were really paranoid. Something's going to happen. They were always afraid that something's going to happen to me. And there was a lot of fear. And I grew up around that. And it's not very comfortable. And then, of course, you can have family guardians who are not very much concerned and they're really loose about it. So... But basically, this fear that we have for whatever it is, our kids, our finances, our body, our future, it's a projection. We're projecting something from the past into the future. And it always comes back to me. It always comes back to the I thought. I am someone separated from the source therefore i really need to look after myself i really need to watch out for myself that's i am separated from the source and uh I really have to worry about what's going to happen in my retirement. How am I going to make it? What's going to happen to me? How am I going to pay my bills? What's going to happen to me 10 years from now? On? Um, what ha what's going to happen to my children 10 years from now? On? So I need to worry about it. I need to be, to be concerned about it. 
but it all goes back to me, to the I thought, the preservation of the individual, of the separated individual who has this sense of disconnection, has a sense that it's someone, somebody separated from the source, separated from totality, and it has to look after itself. So as you, um, your awareness starts to expand and you become more meditative and you're diving more within yourself and starting to realize that there is an order in existence. And, and if you get more evolved and you get to the point that you start realizing that this I thought, this individual, this person who has a sense of separation, rightfully, because that's how we were born, basically, into this world, the Lila, and basically every human being after age, age two, two and a half, picks up their ego, and they begin to have this sense of separation uh, and begin to, as they get older, they begin to start to identify with their own personal authorship as this is my life and I'm the creator of this life and uh, I'm creating my own reality. Uh, I make mistakes. And when I do something really good and I win and I gain, you know, I'm very proud of myself. My ego comes and says, look at me, look at me. I did it. I created it. I worked hard and I got to this point. And when I'm in situations that I lose, uh, whatever that is, um, I blame myself that I made mistakes. I'm an idiot. I'm stupid. I never learn. And the mind comes, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with it, that going through the process of self-hate, self, -hate, self um, lack of self-love, not accepting ourselves, and blaming ourselves for our past mistakes um, and our shortcomings. So that sense of separation is... And that sense that I am a person separated from the whole. Therefore, I'm really responsible for my actions. Then because we have that sense, then we take it very personal and we keep projecting this fear into the future. And, uh, and it's haunting us. And if you... Uh, really look at it, a lot of our decisions basically in life is coming from fear of what's going to happen to me. Basically, what's going to happen to me? What about 20 years, 10 years from now on when I'm older? What's going to happen to my retirement? What's going to happen to my assets? What's going to happen to people around me? Am I going to be lonely? And you can see that as you're getting older, you're just hanging on on things stronger, you know, whatever you can hang on to. And some people become very fanatic because of the fear of losing. So you're just really hanging on to things. Your grip gets tighter. And it's ironic because life is going to do whatever it wants to do. And uh, no matter how hard you're trying to hang on to things or dear life or, or whatever situation, uh, life does its thing and it doesn't care. Or fear of disease, fear of sickness. Or, of course, uh, today's subject is coronavirus. So what happens if I get it? Or what happens if I die? 
so you just kind of look into this and you look at yourself and you pay attention as awareness comes and when you're making your decisions in life uh, pay attention take a look at it see where it's coming from where from what place you're making this decision you're in a relationship with somebody um, and it's going really well or it gets rocky and all of a sudden fear comes but that fear when you chase it to to look where it's coming from you're gonna you're gonna see it always goes back to me what's gonna happen to me if my partner leaves if my partner dies if my kids leave me what's gonna happen to me it's always a me there And then, of course, you know, we're noble. Um, we want to be cool. And now we're worried about others. At first, maybe you're worried about your family. Then you're worried about your countrymen, environment, animals. So, yeah, I'm also worried about those things. But no, I basically... You are worried about yourself. You're afraid for yourself, really. That's the way it really goes back to. As you go forward and your consciousness begins to expand and you're becoming more awake and you're starting to notice that this sense of separation is not real there is a sense but you go deeper within yourself and you start as the mind becomes quiet a couple of different things happen a is you begin in your the expansions of your consciousness you begin to be able to observe the rise of fear fear is something that rises it's a passing emotion. But so many people around the world are so much used to it and so much their behavior actions is based on this uh, behavior that they are totally identified with it and they just have no idea of um, this is what's going on. I have zero idea what's going on. So they're ruled by it. But then as start, you start waking up, a couple of different things starts to happen. A is you start, if you're lucky and you are in a sort of a spiritual teachings or somehow you come across this information, you're able to watch. You're watching your mind and you're observing your emotions and when the thought comes, because where is fear, really? When you're projecting fear into the future, I'm not talking about fear that someone's running towards, mm -hmm. towards you with a knife or uh, you find yourself in a dangerous place. That's your nervous system. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what's haunting you. Is that a thought or an emotion comes and, and it's passing through, whether you were watching uh, the news and they're talking about, yeah, we're projecting like by 2025, half of the population of planet is going to die. Just somebody just said something on the news and all of a sudden you start getting anxiety and fear because somebody said something. It doesn't mean anything. Somebody just said something. And you're giving importance to this reporter or whatever uh, it is. And your nervous system gets triggered. Your mind gets activated and you start panicking or worrying about, oh, my God, we're going to die. Well, you're going to die anyway. But when you're trained 
and you start to look at things, and you're going to start seeing that something from the outside has triggered you. You got some kind of news. Something has triggered your conditioning. Your, what is your conditioning? Your conditioning is to having this illusion that you are going to be around forever and having this illusion of preserving everything. And because preserving things around you gives you this false illusion that you are in control. You want to control your surrounding, your family, your relationships, your money, the environment. So it makes you feel good. Things are staying the same. Things are stable. So you feel good about yourself, which is never happening. It always changes. So you're waking up, you're starting, you begin to kind of see and, and become aware of fear rises. It's an emotion that rises or it's passing in another way, it's passing through you. And you become aware of it and you watch it. And you remain still, you stay in stillness and you remain the watcher of this emotion that's coming and going. And as a result of that, you're not reacting to it. You simply are aware of its presence. You're aware that fear arises and you're aware of it. And your body may react to it, but you're just like in inwardly, you're just still. And then it goes away. And when it goes away, what's there? When fear rises and fears goes away, what's there? You, the observer, is the one who stays here, is always here. You, because you don't go anywhere, you're here. You're always here. Because you're the watcher. You're the observer. You're the one who is still and here and everything else comes and goes in front of you. So that's one thing. Another thing happens is that slowly, slowly, if it's in your path and you were meant to be at that place and, and expand to this consciousness, you begin to realize there is no you. The you is simply illusory. This you who's in control of life or your life and does whatever it does and makes good decisions or bad decisions is really is a non-existing element. Because existence is operating through you. It's that which is making decisions through you. So there is no you. So as you start to realizing that, your fear starts to disappear and loses its potency because who is afraid? Who is afraid of what? I'm, I'm not in control of life. Life is living me. So what am I afraid of? Because there's no me. What I think as me is sense. It's the senses of separation. Sensory. But I cannot be separated from life. No one else can be. Everyone is a part of the totality. So it is consciousness, it's totality that's operating because there's nothing in the world you can do which is not connected to life, to everything else. Everything you want to do is connected to everything else. Try to do something that's not connected to everything else. 
You can examine it for yourself. It's impossible. You're, I mean, it's so obvious. You just have to get out of this box of brainwashed and hypnotized place of separation that we have born into. And as you're expanding, you begin to see, and I'm gonna explain this to you. Somebody sent me some messages. Let me read these messages first. Um, Danielle, do you want to, instead of me reading the messages, do you want to talk to me directly? I'm going to, you can unmute yourself and we can, you can ask me your question or share with me your thoughts and then I can answer it and everybody else can hear it. If, if you're cool with that. Oh yeah, I, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, um, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Have we met before? No, never, but I, I've been following you and seeing your work. I've seen you with longer hair. <laughs> right, right. And uh, yes, I was, me, I'm from a native tribe in Canada, in New First Nations of Quebec, Canada. And I, I thought, you know, like, it's like the, the concept of uh, the tree and the forest. I always felt like I was like a tree, but I was also at the same time, I was uh, conscious of the forest, like having to come to, uh, having to, um, to, to, um, to, how do you say that? I, I wrote that, but it's like, <laughs> I have a difficulty. I need to read it. Um, yeah, I was creating my own identity while conforming to my Inu native tribe, but I had the intuition that my happiness was also depending upon others too. If my peers had no lunch at kindergarten, I had to share mine with the one less lucky, then I felt happier this way only. And I was wondering, uh, how do you explain um, our uniqueness if there is no me? Yeah. Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Well, in, in one way explaining it is we're all different expressions of the absolute. We are, it's like God, I'm just using this word God, consciousness, the spirit, the big kahuna, uh, mother nature, whatever name you want to give it to it, it doesn't matter. So let's go beyond that. But existence expresses itself, totality, life, manifestation creates, the creator is creating. And when it's creating, it's creating different, these unique expressions of itself, of the absolute. So in the expression, we're all very unique. There's only one Dan Danielle, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Danielle? Yes, of course. Okay. There is only one Danielle in this world, and there's only been one ever, and there would never be another one identical to you. Danielle happens once. It's an expression happens once in the entire vastness of eternity one time this expression happens there may be another one looking like you or close to you or similar or very very like you maybe happened two three hundred years ago 
but this one only happens one time. So it's very unique. It's very special. Everyone is very unique and very special. But all these expressions, all these people who are born and die, they're all different aspects and expressions of the same one of the oneness. The oneness expresses itself in unique individuals. But that doesn't mean the, the individual is separated, the expression, the person who's born and living this life, you can see from the back that there is like a cord because it's not visible and this cord is connected to the source and whatever this dude is going to do and say it's being connected to the main computer the only thing is the problem is or or the way it's designed this life is this guy for most of his life is not supposed to know that he is an expression of the one most of his life is supposed to think and feel and sense that he's separated that's the part of the plan it's, this is God's will that has created this sense of separation. And to create that sense of separation, they give us an ego. We come with an ego and the ego is developed around age two because up to age two or two and a half, when the baby's born, it was up to age two. They, don't, they have not picked up an identity. They're still, they're completely enlightened at that age. And that's why they call it the terrible two. Because around that age, the baby is, starts to pick up, their ego kicks in, and then all of a sudden, this is mine, you know, two kids are playing with each other. This is mine. No, they start, mommy, mommy, this is mine. All of a sudden, things become theirs because they start to develop this sense of separation that they're an individual being separated from everything else their ego starts to appear but since we live in the world of duality this is the dual world so one thing cannot exist without the other one You cannot have anything in this world has its opposite existing simultaneously. Nothing can exist without its opposite. It's impossible. So white, black, day, night, man, woman, dark, light, darkness cannot exist without light, and light is meaningless without darkness. They need each other. So if existence, God is going to create the individual with a sense of separation, with an ego, with the sense that I'm separated from everything, then in the meantime, it must create the sage. It must create the enlightened one. It must create the master too. To balance it. Because it cannot be all individuals with a sense of separation without the sage. Because the opposite of it has to be there. Now... Yeah, we have 7 billion people and we're not going to have 7 billion enlightened masters. But there's enough 
to offset that. That's the way it works. And there's people coming and telling me like, uh, I come across a lot of, uh, especially like this Saturday, I went to this event disclosure fest and uh, I come across a lot of people who are very much into uh, preservation of the planet Earth and preservation of of the humanity, and they're really worried about what's going to happen in the future of humanity, or the Illuminati, the dark force is right now is very strong and is controlling the world, and and they created the pandemic, and they're going to be killing a lot of people, and uh, the world is going into the darkness, and da 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 da, which in appearance yes it appears that it's going in that direction that's true but yet in the same time there is the the light force light forces that are battling the dark forces if you go to like uh zoroastrianism religion of zoroastrianism it's talking about the dark forces and the light forces. They're in this constant battle with each other. So as so we are the unique expression of the absolute, but we're not separated from the absolute. Making sense? So, of course, in this life, you until you're fully awakened, until the sense of separation disappears and you lose that sense, until that moment, you don't have a choice rather than acting that you are an individual that you have to preserve yourself and take care of whatever you have to do you don't have a choice you're going to do exactly accordingly to your makeup whatever is your makeup whatever is your conditioning whatever is your dna like for example i'm going to give you an example like um like i am mostly very tidy i like and i like things I, I can't operate let's say if i'm in my my home and it's messy and there's dishes sitting in the sink or there's clothes all over and there's paperwork all over it drives me crazy i need to just clean up and put everything correctly to where it needs to be not in an extreme way but I need to be tidy, then I can work. If I want to do some work, I can't do the work if it's really messy. So I have to tidy things and then I feel good about it. And then I can do my work. But I have a couple of good friends that they operate in mess. It's completely messy. Everything is messy. And I would never be able to do that. And I can change myself to be them, and they can change themselves to be me. But they're operating, and they're running their business, they're running their show, they got family, they do whatever they do, they make money, they pay their bills, but they're messy. They don't mind leaving dishes in the sink, they don't mind, um, you walk into their bathroom you know there's like the toothpaste the top is not connected everything is all over you know you may walk on on uh, some toys of their kids and they have to watch out where you put your foot and things are dirty you know and they're fine with it and they're good people but that's how they live so it's their dna it's their makeup or I have, you know, I've been, 
yeah, you can see that with people who are very stingy. They're very tight spending money. They're calculating every penny. And then you're around people who are very loose and easy with, with money. And you, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't change the tight one, the stingy one into being generous and you can't make the generous one to be tight. It's just impossible. They got their own makeup and that's how they're operating and they're not changeable. And these are different expressions of the absolute. Each person is how exactly life wants to express itself in that form, in that time. And as you're waking up and you're coming to this higher level of consciousness, you begin to recognize that. You begin to realize. And as you recognize that and you realize that one of its benefits is peace begins to take over. Inner peace starts to come. Because you have expanded your consciousness, you have elevated your awareness, your consciousness, you're going to a fifth dimensional, to a 5D consciousness of the unity consciousness, of the oneness, a place of no separation. And peace comes, acceptance comes, surrender comes. Was it helpful, uh, Danielle? Yeah. Feel free if you have any other questions, we welcome it. Ms. Hilda, so you brought up this topic. You have any questions, my dear? Hi. Hi. Nice seeing uh, you. Yeah, thank you. We haven't talked for a while. I haven't uh, seen you for a while. Nice seeing you too. Uh, you know, I grew up with the old parents and I was the only, the only ch child, you know, and they were uh, always afraid of me. Don't do this and don't do that. And when I got the, the arthritis, they turned into be more afraid, you know, don't hurt yourself and take care and everything. So they love me, but I feel that I might be lived in a prison of love, you know. In a what? Prison of what? Prison of love, because they love me so much. So don't do this and don't, don't do that. So you can hurt yourself. You know, so I, I understand that my fear was that uh, was uh, the way they fought and they act and it was they fear that they gave me in so to speak yeah you know yeah yeah and I they mean, always told me that oh but you are doing this and you're not afraid of some something but i become a kind of rebellious because of that you know because i won't i didn't want to live like that you know i yeah yeah hmm. Yeah, well, it's, you know, I, again, I grew up with parents who were fanatic in fear. Yeah. And uh, it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> and of course, I mean, I was a very good, obedient boy, very quiet till age 12. And then around age 12, they changed my school. And they mm -hmm. put me in this other school that was kind of hostile and and all of a sudden I had to go into this mood of preserving myself so I had to change myself becoming a bad boy and and uh, to protect myself from really being a good boy who was very quiet and obedient um, coming from this place of um, being protected. And all of a sudden, it's like I find myself in this jungle <laughs> and it's violent. And, uh, and I wasn't a tough guy. It wasn't my personality. I wasn't angry. I wasn't tough. 
So then I remember I started going, taking karate classes and, uh, and start beating out of other kids or start bugging other kids or just to, to mask this, to cover it. I had to become aggressive with other children. So they leave me alone. They find me like he's a tough guy and we're not going to mess with him to protect myself. It wasn't because I was tough. And uh, then dealing with these parents who were just ultra protective all the time. I mean, to, to a point of suffocation, you know, like I was feeling suffocated. Like I couldn't breathe because they're all over me all the time. Yes. So, so um, somehow, I mean, in most cases, uh, they transfer their fear to you. Yeah. Somehow, that really did not happen with me. Uh, it was in my destiny, and that's rare. I think most people will just absorb the fear of the parents or their conditioning, and they continue replicate that. For me, I think genetically, somehow there was this boldness and this craziness uh, that started to reveal itself years after, uh, and rebellious, you know, this rebel that whatever you tell him he can't do, he wants to do it. Don't tell him you can't do this because it's going to be worse. And uh, wanting to be independent, wanting to make my own money, wanting to go my own way. So for a number of years, I was trying to run away from the parents uh, because of the suffocation that I experienced. Mm. And it's interesting, you know, as you get older and, your consciousness expands and then you're starting to see, oh, wow, you know, I really love these people. And even though I find them crazy or I, f I find myself coming from another planet, because many times I thought like, who are these people? <laughs> who are my parents? You know, what the hell am I doing in this family? Because we have nothing in common. Uh, they're always afraid of everything. And I'm wild and crazy and want to experience and experiment everything. So we're so different in that level of what the hell am I doing here? Uh, going to this feelings of being a stranger in a strange land uh, on planet Earth, which I still feel like, what am I doing on this planet? There are times that the feeling comes like, I don't know if I belong to this, you know, this is, this is weird here. There's a weirdness on this planet. And I know a lot of people on spiritual path feel the same way. A lot of us have this in common because we were the black sheep in the family and we were always felt different, never felt really one, one of, you know, you're in your high school, you're in college or whatever, and you don't feel like you're one of them. They're all excited about the football game. They're all excited about the baseball game. They're all excited about the new president or whatever. And you don't give a shit. I mean, it's just like, you know, you try to fit yourself and be excited about it and look like everyone else and act like everyone else. But inside you don't. You feel like you're a stranger in a strange land. So, but back to what you brought up, um, yeah, some, if, basically, if it's in your path, and it's your DNA, and your makeup to be fearful, and then you grow up with parents who are paranoid, you pick that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I understand that I needed to feel that fear for, from some, some, uh, some days ago that I could uh, 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 ask you to talk about this and I will understand everything in another way, you know. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. obviously, 
obviously it was a part of my karma to grow up and be a teenager living with parents who were paranoid about everything. I mean, we had so many fights and so many battles about me going skiing or me going for a swim or, or going to down, down on our, in our neighborhood street to play with the other kids. It was like a nightmare. It was always like an issue to do that. And I went through years of feeling really suffocated, like not being able to breathe. And that is the worst feeling ever. Yeah, and it's, you know, it hasn't ended, you know, it's still there. It's still, every time I talk to my mother, I mean, she's the last one standing and, uh, oh, I'm so worried about you. I go, what are you worried about? <laughs> oh, because, da, 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 da. or, oh, you know, oh, you're driving, you're going to Sedona. I'm so worried about you. Please drive slowly. I go. <laughs> like, that's very noble of you, mom. Just be wor You're always worried about something, you know? It's like it's in there. It's like they don't know what to do with themselves if they're not worried. Mm. Like, it's so ingrained in their psyche of worrying about something. And they're going to find something to worry about whether it's their kids or what's going on in the world or whatever it is, they find something to worry about. Yes. But that's their makeup and that's their karma. And that's, that's what the expression, that's how God wants to express itself in this life through them. And and if you're not that type, it's uncomfortable for you. Any, anyone else? Any comments? Any questions? Anything? Let me see if we got in the chat box. Anybody wrote anything? Um, and those of you on our Facebook, I appreciate you joining me today. I, uh, it's hard for me to answer questions on Facebook. Um, so if you want to have a direct connection uh, during the web, uh, during the academy. Oh, someone's asking me, do you have kids? Uh, no, I don't have any children. Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Where are you from, Andrea? No, I don't have kids. So, no questions. Yeah, those of you on Facebook, if you uh, like to be in direct communication, I recommend you sign up through my website, which is zaratustra.tv. And um, join us at the academy, and um, we can talk directly because a lot of times it's hard for me to go from one screen to another screen. Okay, we have another. Hi, right, Kamala, do you want to share with us? Yes. Hi. Hi, Hi. nice to see you. Nice to see you all. Good evening. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> it's just like when I think about fear, for me, it's very much about yeah, it's a fear of uh, of being seen, uh, of being received, actually, because I'm not sure sometimes if I want to be seen. Right. 
I'm, I'm scared of it. I'm right. scared of, of, of showing you who I really am. Right. So, there's so much fear on that. I understand. Yeah. So, and it's, and, and you also said something about being the, being the observer and observing myself going into the coping mechanisms or, and the patterns and the usual reactions and the hiding or the stagnation or the holding back or the self-sabotage. Uh, and it's like there's a screen, like a, a glass shield between uh, the observer or my higher self, who I really am and what's going on out there. Um, but it's, it's for me right now where I am with it, it's good because I see it and I can stop it before I, I do my usual thing and I can work on the trust and, and the, the self-love and the, right. Yeah. right. Well, maybe you can say something about it. I don't know. Well, the basically. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, if some, if you're uncomfortable of being seen, you know, there, this idea that everybody has to be the same or everybody has to be uh, in a certain way is also, it's an illusion. And, and there are people who it's not in their makeup to be out there. But I have a good friend of mine, a buddy of mine, and uh, a few times we were talking about uh, what I'm doing. And he likes to teach, but he likes to teach one-on-one, -on -one, work on, with individually. And we were just talking, I said, you know, my design is I like to be in front of large crowds. And uh, I was saying, yeah, I can see like you don't have any fear of walking on a stage in front of 500 people. It's not like the moment you're walking on the stage, you don't have any fear. Fear comes. And I experience it. You know, you get these sensations, but it's also the excitement of, wow, I'm going to be standing in front of a thousand people or 500 people. And that excitement of, it's going to give me an opportunity to take them into that place, take them into silence or bring them into their heart. I, get it. I have an opportunity to do that with them rather than individually doing it. Now I can have an impact on the larger crowd. That excitement overrules the fear of that moment of walking up on the stage. But in the meantime, that this is one um, expression of the absolute. It means the, the boss, the big kahuna wants to express itself in this way and as another way it expresses itself in a way that okay i'm you know i don't want to be seen and i don't think any of it is good or bad it's just the way it is and of course it's the nature of the mind comes and wants wants to judge it and the mind comes and says oh well you know that's your fear or blah 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 but that's how you are yeah, it's for me. It was I was also very different from my parents, and so a lot of uh, uh, the fear that they had was that I <laughs> that I would uh, sing and dance and be very uh, yeah artistic in my right. Expression. And they were worried that you're going to be out there exposing yourself. Right. Yep. So yeah. I get it. So it's 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 just to 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 say that it's what I have to work on now in my life. 
so when I experience fear being present, it is often about this and about my self-doubts. Do I dare to show myself? Do I dare to, to do it, to step out? Right, right. Yeah. Well, well you, what you can do, one thing, I mean, you can do is basically to look at it, to simply be aware that self-doubts is coming. Yeah. And being aware, oh, okay, I'm about to perform and uh, sing or dance or, uh, and the fear comes of, oh, wow, you know? Well, basically it's about what? It's about judgment. Okay, am I gonna screw up and are they gonna judge me that I'm not good enough? And, but where does that go? If you trace that back. Yeah, it is the I, it's the me. It goes back to this I who thinks it's separated. Therefore, if it does a good job, it's praised. And if it does a bad job, it's smashed. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to that I. And then if you question that, like, who, who am I? Who is this I? Then it just goes back into silence. If you question it, if you look at it, which is a very good place to be spiritual, spiritually, it, because you're really, this is a deep place. You're really questioning who am I? Who is this I? And that is worried or is worried to be exposed or not, what is it? So you start digging into that. And then I realize, and I know, and I come back to it, that, yeah, I'm, I'm God. I'm the creator. I'm part of creation. And so I have to trust that. And so that is what I'm... <sighs> I really try to surrender into that every time I, I experience this fear coming up. Yeah. Fear. Yeah. Yeah. So you can turn the fear, you can turn the poison into medicine. You can welcome the fear and use it as an opportunity to question the existence of this imaginary I am separated. In a way, you know, every time it comes, it says, okay, great. Now, instead of really, it's going to change your attitude to it, if you can. Yeah, I was recording a song yesterday and playing the piano. It makes me insecure. I, I feel comfortable with the song, the singing, but the piano is something different. And so I experience this doubt coming up, this self-doubt. Right. Just having this conversation. Right. Yeah. right. Believe me, I mean, self-doubt comes for me every once in a while. You're, you're not the only one. You know, every once in a while, the thought comes that am I might screw up. Or should I be doing what I'm doing? Or, or this should have been a lot more. Uh, successful than where it is the thought comes am i doing it right or you're not the only one it's a thought that comes into everybody's mind you know and for me is yeah it's when it rises, and sometimes it's a feeling or whatever, maybe it brings depression or sadness or, or a feeling of wasting your life or you're not doing anything. The thought comes, the emotion comes with it. For me, when I catch it and I notice that it's there, I just kind of watch it. I can't do anything about it. So there are moments that the feeling of uselessness may come. But if I just stay in this place, it goes away. It's like anything else. It doesn't have any power. 
when you're watching it. Because awareness has taken over. So you're simply aware of the feelings. Because, you know, again, because we're not connected apparently to the one mind. We, we're not at that place that collectively I can feel what you feel. Uh, I can hear, I can hear your thoughts. I mean, we are connected. I'm not saying we're not, and we, we feel a lot about each other, but we, as a species, we haven't come to this place of um, having this telepathic communication on a clear channel yet. So we, because we have this sense of separation, we are living in this world completely isolated from everyone else. So you think you're the only one who is going through what you're going through. And each and every person feels that way. I'm the only one who has doubts. But, you know, as I'm sharing it with you, it, it arises in everyone. Even the most enlightened person, I've, I never had the honor of meeting him in person, but I refer to him as my spiritual grandfather. Ramana Maharishi, who is the teacher of my teacher, Papaji, Punjaji. Ramana Maharishi became enlightened, awake, and fully realized at age 16. And, or 13, something like that. And then he leaves his hometown and he goes to Arunachala in Tiruvannamalai. And he sits under this mountain called Arunachala, which is a red mountain. And we call it, it's like the sister of Thunder Mountain in Sedona. So they're like brother sisters. So Ramana is living in a temple or in a cave under this mountain. And then disciples, people find out about him. They, you know, after a few years, they realize like this is a sage. This is a fully realized sage. And they create, they build the uh, ashram for him, which is still there. And this is like in like 1920s, 30s. He died, I think, in 1952. Um, but anyway, thousands of thousands of people have gone to Ramana Maharishi and his presence, he was the embodiment of silence. Ramana Maharishi in the modern history of gurus and sages, I think it was, in my opinion, is the biggest one. And he was the embodiment of silence. And thousands of people got enlightened from just looking into his eyes because for 30, 40 years, he never left the ashram. He was always there at the foothill of this mountain, Arunachala, and he never went anywhere. And thousands of people, uh, pilgrims, spiritual seekers that they came to him got healed, got enlightened, all kinds of different things happened. But Ramana Maharshi, one day, according to the tales that I heard, he freaks out and he's running into the forest. He's walking, going to the forest and he's like, God, God, you know, all these people come to me and you know, they want to come and, you know, put their head on my shoulder. I'm the papa to millions of people. Who do I go to? Who do I go to? So he's running into the forest and he's going to the state. 
And to the point that all of a sudden he says, okay, Aruna Chala is the physical manifestations of Lord Shiva. And okay, here's my guru. So he just comes back to the ashram. What I'm saying is, don't be hard on yourself and anyone, any person. It's natural. It's a part of the game that every once in a while we doubt ourselves. We doubt everything. Fear comes. And we doubt it. We doubt things. That's a part of the deal. Andrea, I actually have been able to look at, where are you? We lost you. You're still there. Okay, you're from Germany. And then what is your, do you believe, okay, from Andrea. I'm sorry, if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, forgive me, Andrea. Do you believe in one body we are? One body. I'm not exactly sure if I understand, but yes, it is one body. It's just... It's the one that appears as many. The one that appears as many. There's only one. And that one appears as 7 billion human beings. But behind it, it's still that one. So in that way, yes, we're one body. It's nice to see everybody. I missed you all. I was really looking forward to today. Uh, okay, Andrea says that, but we should try um, to do it, to connect inside of ourselves. Yeah, Andrea, you don't have a choice not trying to connect with yourself. Once you're invited on a spiritual path and you're going through the process of self-awakening, you're pretty much screwed. You know, you're, there's no way back. You can't go back. So you get impregnated by God. God gets you pregnant. Gets you, puts puts the seed of awakening inside you. And this seed is like a time bomb. And in different people, it explodes in different time. Some people it's going slowly. Some people all of a sudden explodes. Once you get on this path and, and the big love, the big kahuna reveals itself to you, you are screwed. There's, that's it. You're really literally screwed in a way, in a sense of saying, because now you tasted God and you want more. You want more. You can't stop. You can't go back. So you're forced to look inside and dive within yourself. And yeah, the connection comes, whether you like it or not, because as you get more connected with yourself, you find a bigger connection with existence. That doesn't mean that you get more connected with yourself. You want to be around people. Not necessarily. Because a lot of people go deeper within themselves 
in the awakening and the more they're awakened the less they want to be around the sleepy ones because the sleepy ones they're disturbing them so there's no one formula some people go through awakening and they go into teaching and they share and some awakened ones they go in isolation there is no right or wrong to it that's the way it is All right, well, nice seeing everybody. This broadcast is, re is recorded, hopefully, I believe so. I mean, Amir's been working on it. It says it's recorded. And we're going to be uh, emailing it to you. Those of, those of you who we have your email, we're going to send it to you. And um, we're going to be putting it after it's uh, cleaned up, we will put it on my YouTube channel. You will have access to the full recording and we also chop it up and we put 10 minutes, 10 minutes, uh, short version of it on our YouTube channel. And uh, we put the full broadcast on, uh, I think you will put it on Facebook because this one's got this, microphone and it's not a good recording i don't know so and i think our system is good enough right now for the podcast i'm hoping like we we recorded this correctly uh hopefully next week we're planning on broadcasting on youtube my youtube channel and the zoom uh if we can get our internet quality to a point uh, that is working well. Um, we're planning on doing that. My channels are Zaratustra 5D. We have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, my website is uh, zaratustra.tv and my email is info at zaratustra.tv. So if you want to communicate with me, you can write to me via email and I'll be very happy to uh, get back with you. I don't have any uh, programs coming. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, forgot. <laughs> I'm presenting an, an event. It's a 5D event uh, being... Um, hosted by David Farman, and that's going to be in Sedona, Arizona. And I'm going to be, I have two events on, uh, I think it's Saturday, June 24th and June 20, July 24th and July 25th. And that's going to be in Sedona, Arizona. So we're going to be putting it up on my website as well as um, sending an email to everyone. So... If anybody feels compelled to come to my two events, you're welcome to. If you're in the U.S., of course, it's easy to travel because they took, I think, uh, uh, I believe that, uh, I mean, as far as I know, we can travel freely in the U.S. right now. I know for the, a lot of Europeans and people from other countries, there's still not a lot to come to the U.S., and uh, but anyway, if you're in the U.S. and you want to come to Sedona, Arizona and meet me uh, almost towards the end of July, please do. I'll be happy to see you. Sending you a lot of love and light. And I hope to see you next Wednesday. Namaste.